shields, when they went out in battle, were made, were covered in copper. And whenever you have copper in the sunlight and the sun shines down on it, it's going to give a reddish tint. It's going to look red. Which is obviously, it's part of the psychology of warfare. It's just one of the many ways that they terrified the people they were conquering. Um, red was also a very important color to Assyria in a lot of the ruins and some of their artwork and things that have been left. Red is a prominent color there. I don't think, I, I don't think there's anything lost there. They were a bloody people. They were violent. They were bloody. They were brutal. They loved red. I think they loved red because red was the color of blood and they were blood drunk in a sense. They couldn't get enough. The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broadways. Now, this is interesting because I had, it's been many years since I've taken a world history survey. Many, many years. And so I had to brush up a little bit on my knowledge with Assyria. One thing I learned that I didn't know before, their chariots were like the Sherman tanks of their day. You saw a, a, a group of Assyrian chariots coming for you. It's not good. It's bad. Um, part of their chariots were made of iron. They were big. They were strong. They were sturdy. Um, I know at least I, I know at least three men in this room. At least three, maybe more, who've seen Ben Hur. And we all remember the chariot race, at the beginning of the chariot race, when everybody's lining up, and Masala comes driving up the way, arrogant as ever, in his Greek chariot. And he sort of looks over at Judah and is like, today's the day. And Judah's like, yes, Masala, today's the day. And then the sheik runs up and is like, Judah, Judah. He has a Greek chariot, and everybody looks, and the camera, point of view of that camera, goes to his wheels, because out of his wheels, he has these little spiky things. They almost look like, it almost looks like they have teeth, like saws, to use to cut and destroy the, the wheels and the chariots of other drivers. Apparently, Assyrian chariots had in the hubs, very similar to that, either a sith or a... I don't know, if it wasn't a sword, I think it would almost be like a Scottish dirk. Which a dirk is not quite a knife and it's not quite a sword, it's a little bit in between. You know, it's very, it's too small to be a sword. It's a little too big to be a, what you consider a knife, but it, it gets the job done. Um, so, it could have looked like something like this, like a sith that was coming out of their wheels. Or it could have been like a dirk, which, I mean, that's, I know, that's, I know. My artwork is, it's wonderful, isn't it? It's not Bob Ross. You're not going to get happy trees here. Um, but it's kind of like that. And so when this, the chariots are jostling one against the other in the broadways and the streets, that's what we think is meant by that, that, you know, Assyrian chariot, chariots would get as close as they could to the enemy just to destroy it. Um... So, that's one of the things that the Assyrians did. I also did some other research just to re-familiarize myself with um, some of the things they did. Jack has pointed out several different times in the last few weeks that I'm aware of, you know, Assyrians were the inventors of crucifixion. That was something they used. Um, in addition to that, they also impaled their victims. They would impale them on spikes. They would impale them just below the ribs. So it was a mortal wound, but it didn't kill you. So the people languished. If you were impaled by on, on an Assyrian spear or implement, you were going to be there for a while, and it was going to be a very slow, very painful death. Um, another thing they used, they were known for flaying people alive, especially leaders of cities. In countries who dared to oppose them, they would flay them and take the skins and hang them on the gates of the city and on the walls of the city. 
Um, that's what we're dealing with. That's what these people were like. They were very, very cruel. They were also masters of siege warfare. They were the, for a time, they were the undisputed military power, unchallenged. But their day's coming. Five, he shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the defense shall be prepared. So they are going to, you know, they're going to think they're okay because... They're in Nineveh, and Nineveh was a very heavily fortified city from, apparently, each of the walls had at least 150 watchtowers on each wall, and all of those watchtowers were manned with soldiers and watchmen who were armed with arrows, spears, whatever. So they saw somebody coming, and they had enough men up there, you weren't getting anywhere near that city. And that was every wall. From any point from any point in those walls, if there were enough people there, you, you weren't going to make it. Nineveh was impregnable. Six, the gates of the river shall be opened and the palace shall be dissolved. Now this, shortly before, the, the way that the Assyrians are going to be dealt, the, the city of Nineveh specifically, but that's their capital, um, the way they're going to be destroyed is the Medes, Babylonians, led by a young, young king and, and military genius that we know, Nebuchadnezzar, comes against Nineveh and overtakes it. And right before the they come against Nineveh and they totally destroy it, the, I can't remember if it's the Tigris or the Euphrates or both, but there was a there was a flood in that area, and it was severe enough that it completely destroyed one of the walls of Nineveh. So that was sort of the first step, and that, from what Dr. McGee, when he gave his analysis, that was very shortly before the... Um, before the invasion. It wasn't too long before that at all. So that's one of the ways that they were able to be taken out. That's one of the ways Nineveh, the impregnable city, the city that could not be destroyed, was destroyed. And here in number, now verse 7 is a little, I want to read it and then we'll talk about it. And Huzab shall be led away captive. Shall she, she shall be brought up and her maids shall lead her as with the voice of doves tabering upon their breasts. Now, Huzab in the King James for a long time was interpreted as maybe the queen of Nineveh or maybe a the name of a goddess of Nineveh, some, you know, some sort of deity, a ruler. Modern scholarship has sort of proved that not to be the case because in most of the modern translations, I looked in the ESV and the Amplified, those were the two moderns that I looked at, and in both of those, it's taken out. It just talks about the destruction of Nineveh. After, once the whole theory about that maybe being a queen or a goddess was taken away, well, maybe that's just a reference to the city itself. Um, another way to interpret that is that Huzab can mean to make... Wait a minute, let me get there. So it can mean that which is established or that which was set down. Um, meaning, it's not a reference to a queen or to a goddess, and it's not maybe talking about Nineveh as like a direct, specific reference to Nineveh, but it's talking about the destruction of Nineveh. I think it could mean the destruction had been set down, it was established, it was going to happen. So that's that's the way that's the way to I think to interpret that. This is where from this point I think it really gets interesting because this is talking about the destruction of a city, but it the way it's described is so very it's so literary and it's so it's such an image that 
I've never, I've never seen the destruction of a city described like this. It describes as a woman, she shall be brought up, and her maid shall lead with her as the voice of doves tabering upon their breasts. The voice of women when they're wailing, and they can't be consoled, and they're beating their breasts because they're, they're in such agony. But Nineveh is of old, like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. They shall want to flee, but it's 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 there. There's nowhere to go. It's too late. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none, for there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. They were very rich. Assyria was not only a military power, they were a they were a an economic power. One of their biggest businesses, I'd say you could probably, the, the business that put them into business that gave them most of their wealth is they were slave traders. That's what they did. They went in and they collected slaves and then they sold slaves. And they sold slaves all across the known world at that time. They, they sold everywhere. Um, that was their biggest, that was their biggest trade. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. Now this is just, it's when Nineveh is empty. They realize there's no hope. The people realize there, there's no hope. This is happening. And when it talks about the heart melteth and the knees smite together, I think about in Daniel when Belshazzar is at the feast and he's brought out all of the temple, the, the implements of the temple, and they're partying up, having a good old time, blaspheming God's, the, the holy instruments of God. And they see that finger start writing on the wall and they don't know what to do. So they go get Daniel and Daniel comes out and he interprets it. He says, basically, your, your kingdom is over tonight your kingdom is going to be taken away from you. And it says, it's, I think it's funny, when it talks about Belshazzar actually looking at the wall and seeing it, it says in one translation, his knees were knocking or they smited together furiously. He was, it, he was shaking with fear and dread. These people are shaking with fear and dread. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the lions where the lion, even the old lion, walked and the lions whelp and none, and none made them afraid? That's talking about Assyria because when they were at the height of their power, there was no one that could challenge them. They were the king of the jungle. The way the lion is the king of the jungle, Assyria, when it, when it had it today, it was the king. Nobody could stand against them. And, and, and that's just the Lord saying, where are you now? Look, look, look how the mighty have fallen. You once went and you once hunted and you once destroyed. And the whole world trembled and gave way in your presence. But where are you now? The lion did tear. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It was a very common. It was a very common sculptural decorative picture of the Assyrian kings um, killing adult lions, hunting. Really? Yeah, they... That's they, cool. I did See, you learn something new every day. I didn't know that. Say they, that again? It was a very common decorative sculpture. They decorated their palaces with the different kings in chariots who were hunting lions, and the lions were being defeated. So it was like the lions were defeating the most powerful. So that's another example of God taking something that the Assyrians would know that would speak to them and using and saying, this is what you did. This is what I'm going to do to you. This is exactly how it's going to be. That That's awesome. I, I, I did not know that. That is so cool. Wow. That's really cool. 
I'm so glad you're here and you got to share that. That's awesome. That just, yeah. My inner nerd is just happy right now. <laughs> Verse 12, chapter 2. The lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps and strangled for his lionesses and filled his holes with prey and his dens with raven. They, they did that. They tore in pieces. They, another thing they did, they liked to collect limbs and body parts of people that they overthrew that didn't. And once the word got out after they did this a few times, anytime they came against a great city or a village or a town, there are, there are records of mass suicides in these areas because the, the entire town or village or whatever would rather die in suicide than be taken alive by the Assyrians. They were that fierce and that dreaded. Because they were like animals. They were lions. They tore pieces. They tore they tore families. They tore communities. They tore people into pieces. With no regard for human life. With no regard for the law of God. No regard for any except their own bloodlust. That's it. Verse 13, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. Now that, that doesn't give you just a little chill in your spirit. To hear the Lord say that, I I think you need to have some time with the Lord. Because when I read that on my own reading, when I came to that verse, that verse just, that chills me to, to my bone. Almost, almost as much as the verse earlier when he says, I am going to bury you. I am going to dig your grave and I am going to bury you. That gives me pause that causes me to want to get right with the Lord and say Lord if there's anything in my heart that needs to be brought before you that needs to be confessed that needs to be taken care of I want to do it now because I want to be I, I want to be in good standing with you I don't want to be I don't want you to be against me And then here we have, here we have, here we just have, we have the destruction. We have more of the destruction. Verse, verse 1, chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city. It is a city full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. Among other things, they were also notorious thieves and robbers. They That was one of their big things, too. Um... So, I mean, in addition to bloodlust, in addition to conquering the world, you know, they, they robbed, which, I mean, I think that all kind of goes together. It's no surprise, really, that all of those things came together. Verse 2, the noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots, just utter and total chaos during this destruction. Utter and total chaos. The horses are going to be neighed. People are going to be running through the streets, panicked for their lives. Men, women, children, animals. It's going to be it's going to be horrible, and it's going to be a destruction that they're never going to come back from. Three. The horseman lifteth lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain, and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their cor corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. Now, I did some research on my own about Nineveh. And at the time that Nineveh was destroyed, there's a pretty good estimate among scholars. They think that there were about 120,000 children alone in that city. So the city was not only well fortified, it was well inhabited. It wasn't just inhabited with men. It was inhabited with women and children, too. And when I read this, you know... I just, my heart, I feel for those kids and I, I, I feel for those women and what they went through. I really do. I just, my heart just, it, it breaks a little bit for that. Um, here we get into some interesting things. Verse 4, because of the multitude of the whoredoms 
of the well-favored hard harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. That is a specific reference to Assyria's participation and really their racket in the slave trade. They were the top. They, I mean, they sold everywhere. Assyrian slaves were top dollar. You bought something from the Assyrians, it was a good slave, and you were going to pay money for it because you knew it was a good. they were a good slave. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame, and I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that shall look that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? Now that right there, as a woman, when I read that, that makes me blush a little bit when I read that. Because he's not just going to destroy them. He's going to lay everything they've done. He's going to lay it, 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 as we say here in the South, he's going to lay all their stuff to bear. It's going to be shame. Yes. Shame. It's going to be shameful. He is going to go out of his way to humiliate them. And I mean, as a woman, there's no better, I mean, that I can't think of a, a way to humiliate a woman more than that or any, yeah, any woman. Basically, just lift up your clothes and just have you out there and everybody see you laid to bear and see what you have and to look at you and to spit at you and to throw things, to throw rotten rotten vegetables and other unpleasantness at you. That's, yeah, doesn't, that, that, it doesn't get much worse than that. And the worst and the saddest thing of all is... This is going to happen to them, and nobody's going to cry for them. Nobody's going to feel sorry for them. Nobody. Hey, art thou better than populous? No, that was that that was situate among the rivers that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea. They thought that because they were where they were, they were. I'm. You can correct me. Huh? Impenetrable. Impenetrable from a from the way the city was built, but also from a geographic standpoint, too, because my memory serves me correct. The ruins of Nineveh are very near the modern day city of Mosul in Iraq. If I'm right, I think I'm right about that. I wouldn't argue the point if I'm not. Um and that location, if I'm remembering correctly, is is in between. The Tigris and the Euphrates, is that right? Does that sound right to you, Ralph or Jeffrey or anybody? My yeah, son. it's very close. Okay. My son was there. He was. Wow. Oh, yeah. He he actually fought near Mosul. Wow. Mm. Wow. Did he were they ever allowed to go in and like see any of the ruins or anything, or was it all sort of he, kept he's bringing back some items. Really? I haven't seen him. He's bringing mm -hmm. back what? If you see him and you get pictures, I'm your new best friend. The treasure. I'm your new best friend. I don't know what it is. It might be just like... I don't care. Cigarette butts. I don't yeah. care. If it's from the ruins of Nineveh, it's a, it may just be a cigarette butt, but it was a cigarette butt at the ruins of Nineveh, and I want to see it. I think that's cool. Um, I'm your new best friend. Don't forget that. Um... Here we go, verse 9. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lebum were thy helpers. Ethiopia and Egypt, that's talking about Cush. Ethiopia is Cush. They're used sort of interchangeably. Egypt, obviously, at one time, Egypt was a very mighty power. Put and Lubum, those, from my understanding, the way that's interpreted is that's basically modern-day Libya. Put and Lubum. Yet was she carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at, to at the top of all the streets. And they cast lots for her honorable men. And all her great men were bound in chains. And this is what they had done at one time. 
They did all of these things, and yet this is what's happening to them. And that's where you also see, in the, in, especially in the law, you see, and not even just in the Mosaic law, but really, if you think about it, this is also a fulfillment of secular law. Because in this area, thousands of years before that, you have a ruler called Hammurabi. You have the Code of Hammurabi. And Hammurabi's code is very similarly worded in some ways to the Mosaic Law, where if you take someone's eye, your eye is taken. If you take someone's finger, your finger is taken. It's, it's, just, it's justice for justice. And here you see that fulfillment because everything they did to other nations, it's being done to them. It's being done down to the tiniest detail. And that tells me that when it says in the word that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, we don't have, there's no better person. There's no better power to have be our vengeance because he knows down to the tiniest, minutest little detail what happened. And when he takes justice, he is going to take justice detail by detail. 11. Thou shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt strength, seek, seek strength because of the enemy. They're, they're drunk. They're given over to lascivious living. They're having a good old time. We don't know. I mean, we don't know that when they're when they're being invaded. But I mean, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, that's what happens, you know, in Babylon. How many hundreds of years later, when Bal when Belshazzar, when the Medes and the Persians invaded that night, he was having a drunken feast, drunken orgy and feast. These people were probably partying like there was no tomorrow. Sad thing is, there really was no tomorrow. That gives me pause. You know, we have to live, we have to live for today as Christians and we have to do everything we can do to sow for the kingdom today, but we have to live to some extent, we have to look, we have to look at tomorrow too, because if the Lord tarries another day, that's one more day that we have to go into the field and reap the harvest. It's one more day we have. To tell somebody with our words, with our lives, with anything, by any means necessary, that Jesus is their salvation. Jesus is the only way. Without him, they're doomed. Twelve. All the strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. So they're basically, their defenses are just are shaken. And I think this is a pretty good reference to the fact that city's not impregnable anymore because if it's shaking like fig trees it's not stable it's shaking in the wind and the figs are falling and all you have to do is just stand there with your mouth open if you want to catch a fig and you're going to catch a fig verse 13 behold thy people in the midst of thee are women the gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies the fire shall devour thy, thy bars here he's talking about how the men weren't too, weren't too valiant. You know, they were great and they were mighty when it was going out, conquering other nations. But when it was happening to them, um, they were like women. They weren't as, they weren't as valiant. They, they, were, they became very weak at this time. Yep. All the very valiant men had died off. Yep. So they were just basically, yeah. 14. Draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Go into clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brickland. Basically, he's telling them you need to prepare for siege. Again, they were the masters of siege warfare. In fact, the Romans borrowed a lot of things from the Assyrians, not the least of which is crucifixion. Only they took it and they sort of perfected the evil cruelty and torture of crucifixion, but they also, siege warfare was the specialty of the Assyrian army. And they are sieged. 15. There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Here we go again, way back to Joel. 
Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Thy crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. So here again, in Joel, when we see the destruction of the land by locusts, the way the locusts come into the land, they're described as an invading army. And here, in Nahum, God uses the image of the locusts, to describe the destruction of Nineveh. Just one more reason why this is the word of God. And if you doubt it, it's there. If you doubt it, it's not because it's not there. It's because you don't want to see it. And you don't want to believe that this is the word of God. One thing you've got to remember is the locust army. It says there, it is God's army. Yes, it is. Amen. And not only is it an army. Well, it's God's army. It's, I mean... The people that in, that destroy Nineveh are the Babylonians, but God uses, God will use the devil's crowd if he has to, to do his will. He'll do that. And he did that. And they are crowned as the locusts. I, I think that image, it's, it's it never ceases to amaze me how that image is just over and over and over. Over and over and over. Verse 18. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. Thy shepherds slumber. When, shep when shepherds went in for the night and put their sheep in the fold, there were no doors, there were no gates on the sheepfold. The gate and the door of the sheepfold was the shepherd, and the shepherd slept between the two poles of the sheepfold. He was the watchman. So what he's basically saying is, Thy shepherds slumber, you're, I'm coming for you, and you're not even aware of it. You're not awake. You're not on guard. I think that's basically the image that is being conveyed here. Verse 19, and we're done. And this is truly, this is, this is also something that makes me shudder. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brood of thee shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? This is not just the destruction of a city. This is the destruction of an empire. Because after the destruction of Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire never recovered. It just, it went down and it went down and it went down until finally it was nothing. And when that happened, no one was sad. Everybody was happy to see him go. And I think that's why, if you think about it, you know, Nahum's name, meaning comforter, it's really not that hard to see how there's comfort in this because 